Right, just waiting on one more panelist, then we'll go ahead and kick off. I believe our last panelist is joining now. Okay, well, we are all good to go um, for our 2 p.m. Uh, young Leaders of the State Ledge uh, panel. Uh, a huge thank you to all of our panelists, uh, not only for joining us here today, uh, but for your fight during this last legislative session, one unlike we have ever seen before in our lifetimes. Um, so we'll go ahead and kick right off. Um, we'll do a quick intro uh, for each of you, um, just a couple of minutes, intro pronouns, where you represent, brief bio, uh, and we'll start with Representative Wiener. Hey y'all, I am Representative Aaron Zwiener. Um, when I was elected, I was the second youngest member of the legislature, but I'm happy now to be the fifth youngest member because it means we have more young folks in the building. And I'm also no longer the youngest woman. There are actually two women members who came in this session who are younger than me as well. So we are seeing more millennials represented in the building. Um, I will say that our youngest member is still Representative Talarico, who I'm sure will make mention of that. Um, but I, part of the reason I bring that up is because Rep Talarico is 32 now, y'all. Um, we actually don't, we don't have anyone from their 20s in the legislature at this point. Um, so I do really want to encourage young folks to look for opportunities, look for um, chances to get engaged because we are still overwhelmingly a, a much older body. Um, and that's reflected in what we do and how we vote. Um, one of the things I remember my first session is, um, there was a, a piece of legislation to say that if somebody rented a property, um, they could carry their gun from their car into the property they rented and that the property owner couldn't have any rules about that. And I asked the author of the bill, would this apply to somebody subletting out a room in their own house? And the author of the bill just looked at me like they'd never heard of anybody doing that before. <laughs> and, and that's, I think, part of why it's so important to have generational representation because the economic reality folks 40 and younger have lived is dramatically different um, from the economic reality that our elders have lived. Um, so I think our voices are really important in the building um, and our voices being more represented in the building will help 
push forward uh, criminal justice reform issues, cannabis issues, and climate change issues, as well as equality issues across the board. Um, so I'm really glad y'all are getting engaged. Hope y'all keep putting pressure on elected officials to make sure that we move forward on these issues that are honestly relatively non-controversial in our generation. Awesome, thank you so much. Representative Crockett. Thank you so much. Uh, so yes, I am Representative Jasmine Crockett. I am actually the old one <laughs> on the panel. Uh, I am the freshman of the group, but I am definitely the oldest. Um, I am the youngest black member of the ledge and I am the youngest black official that holds the um, title of being some sort of state elected official. Um, so yeah, so that's me. I hail from Dallas. I took over for the now mayor of the city of Dallas, Eric Johnson. Um, and it has been a very interesting um, time to be a freshman in the ledge. Uh, but I really do love uh, the energy that comes from the younger generation. We did have more interns than any other office. We had 26 interns. And I am so proud of the things that they were able to contribute to um, my first session, including making sure that I stayed up on all the social media, including TikTok. Um, and so, you know, we became the TikTokers of uh, the ledge. And I think that it was a new and creative way to really involve people who typically just hadn't really been as involved. Um, so I look forward to the conversation. I look forward to your questions. Um, but I will pass it on to the crowd favorite, James Tallarico. <laughs> well, Colby, I don't know if it's okay for me to start, but- uh, Go for it, Representative. <laughs> so I'm James Tallarico. I, I do have the honor of serving as the youngest member, um, but as Representative Zwiener always reminds me um, when I am uh, too tired to go out with all the other young members uh, at the end of a long day that although I'm the youngest member, I'm also the oldest man. Um, so uh, inner 80 year old, uh, but on the outside 32 years old. And uh, Representative Zwiener is also right that um, the day I turned 30 on the floor of the house uh, in 2019, uh, on that day, there were no more 20 somethings in the legislature. And when you look at the demographics of our state, uh, we're, a, we're a fairly young state compared, um, compared to the rest. And, and yet our, our representative body at the state capitol is predominantly older, it's predominantly white, predominantly male, straight, uh, and, and predominantly rich. Um, and so it doesn't look like the rest of the state. Uh, and that's a problem for, for a democratic body that's trying to represent um, a population. And so, uh, I completely agree with my two colleagues that uh, we want to do everything we can to encourage and support all of you and, and other young activists in the state uh, who want to run for office. And whether that's running for the state legislature or whether it's running for local office or national office, uh, we want to be a, a partner to you uh, and help you do that. Because I think the three of us know how difficult it is uh, to run for something as a young person, and we want to make it a lot easier. So. Thanks for having me and excited to join the conversation today. Awesome. Thank you all for joining. Uh, and so we'll just dive right into our first question. Um, some of our questions have been submitted by executive committee members. Some have come from the membership of the general body. Uh, and if we have time at the end, we'll open up to uh, questions from the body before us here today. Uh, but first off, uh, from a constituent of Representative Tallarico, our parliamentarian, Dina Tollerton, um, two part. Uh, what are the best ways to fight gerrymander, gerrymandering throughout the redistricting process? Uh, and do we have any idea when we'll see the first drafts of the Republican proposed maps? So great question. And I know that we are, um, we're among friends on this call and, and all of us are weird political nerds. So I, I probably don't need to explain what redistricting is, but just in case the, the inner teacher in me can't, can't help but ensure that everybody's on the, on the same page. Um, you know, we represent districts based on population. So theoretically, um, Representative Zwiener and Representative Crockett and I all represent the same number of people. But as our state changes um, over a 10 year period, population becomes uneven. And in my district, and I'm sure Representative Zwiener is probably in the same uh, category, but our districts have grown tremendously as the Austin area has, has grown and uh, as people have moved out of the city into the fast growing suburbs. And so I end up you know, I think I represent probably 50,000 more people than I 
than I should uh, based on, on kind of the standard district size in the state. And so after the census is taken and we know theoretically where, um, where the population has changed, we redraw maps so that we all represent the same number of people again. And the crazy part about this is that we as politicians, the three of us on this, on this panel, we draw our own maps, which is a giant conflict of interest, as, as you can imagine. And, uh, and not every state does it like this. Um, and I know the three of us have, have publicly supported an independent redistricting commission of experts who would draw lines based on data, based on numbers, based on, uh, based on the census results, uh, and not based on politics. But that is not the system we have here in the state of Texas. And so uh, this fall, uh, probably September or October, we will get the census numbers back from the federal government and begin the process of drawing new maps. And what that will most likely mean is that our Republican colleagues who hold the majority will, will use the redistricting process to consolidate their power. And uh, they will draw safe conservative seats uh, where a Democrat can't feasibly challenge the current incumbent lawmaker. Uh, and that means that we'll have less competitive elections in the state of Texas, which ultimately is bad for the people of this state because competitive elections keep politicians on their toes and it forces politicians to appeal to kind of the, the folks uh, in, in the 50 yard line, not on the end zones, right? So uh, many people look at the past legislative session and wonder, you know, given all the, the huge challenges we face with the pandemic, the economic recovery, uh, with uh, police violence, uh, with the winter storm, uh, with, with the threats against democracy, all these huge challenges that we face. Why during the legislative session didn't we focus on any of those? And why instead did we focus on permitless carry and anti-trans bills and voter suppression and the heartbeat bill? Why all these really fringe conservative right-wing issues? The answer to that question is redistricting. Because if you represent a hard right district, an 80% Republican district, your only competition is the primary election, not the general election. The general election in those kinds of districts is predetermined based on the, the partisan makeup of the district. And so if all you have to do is win your primary, that forces you as an elected official to cater to the most extreme elements of your party. And in a Republican state, that means we are catering to the million people who vote in the Republican primary in Texas. Out of 30 million, only a million Texans vote in the Republican primary. And those are the ones that are getting their needs met in the legislative session. And the reason is redistricting. And so, you know, I hope that we can uh, use this to start a bigger conversation about reforming our redistricting process globally and holistically. But uh, given that that's not occurring, uh, we're going to be stuck with the system we have, which means we're going to fight tooth and nail um, in, the, in the special session this fall to, to try to um, pr preserve our system where um, voters pick politicians and not politicians picking their voters. Representative Crockett, you're, you know, you're an attorney. You have led on this issue um, in the legislature and in your time before. Are the courts our only recourse here, or do we have any true mechanism of power uh, balance throughout the redistricting process? So, um, yeah, first of all, thanks for the question. And I personally believe in people power. I'm a people power girl. Um, and so when you ask what can you do, there will be hearings that will take place. Um, I am all about making sure that there's a very good record. That's the attorney side of me. Um, so I will be making a really big push for people to actually testify because that's how we do get the backup in the court. If there's nothing on the record about kind of what makes sense for people to be um, in, in areas of common interest, then it's just a lot of arguing um, that happens with the attorneys. So it'll be really important for you guys to organize to the best of your ability to make sure that you participate in those hearings. Um, beyond that, I'm in a little bit of a different situation from the other two reps in that I have a historically protected seat. Um, so my seat is supposed to be um, an African-American protected seat. And so I am supposed to have a population a voting population that is at a very minimum 50% um, Black voting population. Um, that is not what my district currently is. Uh, I don't know if it was when the lines were redrawn 10 years ago. In addition to that, um, you know, uh, Rep Tallarico is correct. We draw our own lines. And just to kind of give a little bit more about kind of how that goes on, um, when you're looking at a delegation the size of a Dallas 
or Harris County or Travis County, um, the delegation comes together and does like the preliminary drawing. So I've actually been plugging and playing. Um, there's a, an app that we use um, called uh, Red Apple. And so I've actually been kind of plugging and playing and the demographers um, Intel is in there right now. So we don't have our real numbers um, because as we know, we really should have picked up three congressional seats and we didn't, we only ended up picking up two. So we don't know what that undercount is going to look like. We don't know what the actual numbers, how much COVID kind of affected really getting an accurate count. And sadly enough, when it comes to black and brown populations, uh, we tend to suffer an undercount as it is. So I technically, in my opinion, will always represent a lot more people um, than I should because there's always a significant undercount. So we'll find out more about that. Um, the demographers do uh, estimate that the majority of the growth over the last 10 years has been due to minorities, um, mostly Hispanic Texans. Um, and so we're looking at, I wanna say it was over 60% of the growth was um, Latino and then uh, a little under 20% was African-American. Um, and then behind that was Asian-Americans. Um, and so I do feel, you know, uh, Representative Tallarico is correct that, you know, we've seen this fringe legislation going on, um, trying to cater to a specific group from a legal standpoint. I honestly don't believe we should be drawing new lines. Um, our constitution specifically says that we will draw lines in the next regular session after we, we receive the census. The next regular session after we receive the census is actually the 88th. And so um, I do hope and anticipate that that will be part of the argument that is made in court because no matter what happens, we're going to court. It's just kind of what always happens. Texas always has to have their hand tapped and told that they're doing something wrong. So I'm hoping that the fact that they went far right was a terrible miscalculation, because if we can somehow operate under the lines as they were this last um, election cycle, I personally believe that in a lot of those tight races, Angie Chen Button still, she played safe on some of her votes. I, I watched her closely. Um, because Angie actually had the closest uh, general election and it was only a little over 200 votes that allowed her to actually maintain her seat. Um, as well as Morgan Meyer, it was about a thousand votes. I wanna say uh, when we look at some of the guys up in Collin County, they were looking at about 2000 votes and it was somewhere between two and 4,000 votes in a lot of those races down in Tarrant County. And so by going so far right and a number of them were leading the charge um, and going far right. Uh, I do believe that if we stick with our same lines that we can flip some actual seats and have some pickups. And by the time we actually do redistricting, be in a better position. So um, that is what I'm hopeful of. Uh, but definitely when those hearings come up, just make sure you show up uh, for those and encourage others to do so. For sure. And uh, we'll toss this next one to Rips Wiener. Um, with we know that a special is coming, right? Um, the the governor is doing his damnedest to be as right as possible because he knows he's gonna face possibly multiple primary challengers. So we know it's coming. If and when SB7 is reintroduced, would you rather see that as an omnibus bill or broken into smaller bills? Um, let me back up just one second on redistricting and add two small things. And then I will go there, even though I'm a little sad we don't have our fellow young member, John Busey or Jessica Gonzalez to break down the election bills. But um, I, I saw we have a congressional candidate in the chat. Um, that idea about us delaying redrawing the lines does not apply to congressional. We have to redraw congressional because that's federal rules. What it, the, there is a legal question over whether or not we have the authority to, to draw the state lines. So that would be the, um, the various courts of appeals, um, our seats, the Senate seats and the State Board of Education. Congressional has to be redrawn, especially since we are adding two seats. Now, there is a very outside chance, very outside, that we get into such a big fight um, over the lines and they are held up in court so long that we run with the seats we have now and then two at-large congressional seats. That's really unlikely, but that's technically possible. We will probably redraw the congressional seats or a court will redraw them for us. 
Um, but speaking of court, I, the thing I wanted to emphasize is everything Representative Crockett and Tallarico said is correct, but I want to note that a group that has historically really been messed with in redistricting is young people. Um, I represent Texas State University. I'm protected by some of the norms we have um, at the house with redistricting where we try and keep counties whole if at all possible, but every other type of district cuts through the center of the Texas State campus. When we had the big fight over polling locations there in 2018, one of the big holdups as we were trying to solve it was figuring out which congressional district the voting box was in because the line literally goes through the middle of the uh, Texas State Student Center. Um, it is ridiculous. And that it was intentionally done to minimize the power of the students. The students are in two different county commissioner precincts to also try and minimize their power. Um, and so the record that we need to build that Representative Crockett mentioned is really important. And I think there's a huge role for college students to show up and say, we are a community of interest. Keep us together whenever possible. Um, and I don't know exactly how all the districts come together in the center of Austin, but I believe UT is divided up a few different ways too, especially if you look at where the students live and the actual campus. Um, so please, please, please work with your college Democrat counterparts and young Dems who are still in college or recent college grads to encourage the university population to advocate for themselves as communities of interest. That is incredibly valuable and helps us build the case that there is systematic disenfranchisement of groups of Texans. Um, okay, so voting legislation, you know, I, 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 there's, there's pluses and minuses to having a big omnibus bill versus lots of little bills. Um, I, I think the avenue we need to take is trying to push on policy. Um, you know, it was, it was a little nerve wracking when we walked out because we don't have control over what, when the governor calls a special, we don't have control over a lot of the mechanisms of power with this. But I'm really encouraged by the fact that we have Republicans backpedaling as hard as they can on this legislation, um, including things that the author of the legislation stood in front of the Senate and defended um, because the, the Senator Hughes stood up and said, oh no, we don't want people to be voting during church. We wanna make sure that they're in church in the morning and then voting in the afternoon. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the House side, we have Representative Travis Clardy saying that's a typo. That was supposed to be a one. They just put an extra one in. Um, I don't know how we explain the AM versus PM in that scenario, um, but we have people claiming mistakes. And then there was a provision that, I don't know, there's a lot of really bad provisions in this bill, but this one was up there, but a provision to say that um, a judge could overturn an election result without any evidence that anyone's votes were fraudulent or cast incorrectly or anything like that, um, which is terrifying <laughs> power. Um, and we have both the Senate and the House claiming they have no idea where that language came from. I mean, y'all, it came from someone. Um, and, you know, I saw, I believe it was Representative Bernal who tweeted this morning that, you know, he can straighten this out for us. Republicans did it. Who cares if it was House or Senate? Republicans did it. Um, so we were able to stop that legislation um, right at the end of session. We were able to put a big spotlight on it. And that's really important. And some of why that's really important is because there were 20 new pages of language added to this bill in conference committee that didn't go through committee in either the Senate or the House that we all had slightly over 24 hours to actually look at before we were theoretically expected to vote on this bill. Um, and nothing good happens when the people of Texas don't have their eyes on the changes that are coming. Um, so I think what's important is that everybody stays very engaged, that we are very loud about exactly what is in the bill. Um, and we're gonna fight like hell to make sure that even if the Republicans are bound and determined to pass something to make their primary voters feel better about Donald Trump losing, that it'll be a something that doesn't actually hurt Texans. You know, if they want to have a video feed on the ballot box after it's closed, okay. Like you want us to have a video to prove that nobody like stuffed that ballot box, we can work with that. What we can't work with is empowering voter intimidation through poll watchers with no limitations. We can't, we can't stand there for um, people being able to overturn an election willy-nilly. We can't stand there for limitations specifically targeted at people of color, disabled Texans or young Texans. Um, and so that's what we're going to need to stand up again. And I think we all know that we've set a high bar for ourselves, which is that if the bill's that bad, 
we might have to leave again. And so we have some leverage with that and we have more leverage, the more y'all pay attention, the more y'all talk about it, whether it's one bill or multiple little bills. What's important is the sunshine. Awesome, Reps Crockett or Tellerico, did y'all wanna to add to that one? I would just add very briefly, um, I agree with everything that was said. And um, <laughs> let me just tell y'all, um, breaking quorum was not an easy feat. I want you to know that <laughs> um, getting a bunch of elected officials who, yes, they may all be Democrats, but they come from very different districts. Um, so there's very different kind of evaluations that are going on and getting enough to say, we will walk out, getting enough to say, I understand that walking out may kill some of my bills, but I think is that important? Getting enough to say, um, I understand that walking out may end up resulting in me being incarcerated by a DPS. Um, there were a lot of different things uh, that were at play. Um, and so we were kind of all on the spectrum. Um, I am a, an activist at heart. I am a protester. Uh, I was ready to be out. <laughs> there was no question about it for me. And Republicans did very good at making threats this session um, and honestly lying a lot this session. There were a lot of times that, uh, you know, Democrats didn't negotiate in good faith. And uh, this bill was an example of that, to be perfectly honest. Um, we actually had a point of order to kill this bill. It was a very artful, I, I don't understand it. I'm gonna tell you, it was over my head. It was John Turner who argued this point of order that really, I mean, the parliamentarians couldn't figure out how to wiggle out of it, right? And so, you know, we had an opportunity to kill this bill, which it wasn't gonna go away forever, but it was going to push it back, right? Um, and instead, leadership ended up in uh, good faith negotiations for hours. I think we left the floor three, four o'clock in the morning on that day. And I was very concerned that this bill would go over to the Senate and regardless of how much work had been done by this bipartisan body, that the Senate would strip out all of our good work and ignore us as if we never existed. And I'm gonna tell you the majority of the issues that we had this session, really they fall at the Senate. Um, and sadly enough, because we continue to grow as a state, but because we are not expanding the number of Senate seats, they are able to retain so much more power by putting all of these kind of rural red areas in with um, the big cities and kind of drowning out the big cities a little bit. And the Senate was the one causing a lot of the problems. I'm not gonna, I'm not giving a pass to the House Republicans, I wanna be clear. But the Senate was causing a lot of the problems. And I honestly believe that the House Republicans were actually pissed as well. I, I really do. I think that they, but they, they would have voted for it because they are nothing but like little soldiers. <laughs> they do as told, right? But I honestly think that they wanted a way out of this bill. I mean, there were Republicans as I was walking out of the building that were like, you know, like get out of here, like give me a thumbs up, right? So, you know, there's a lot of things at play. I think that there were those that had been saying they'll make the, the bill worse. As far as I was concerned, it couldn't get any worse. And honestly, it, it was the right thing to do because as we can see, we were on the right side of history. They would have slid all of this under the radar and said, oh, we didn't know, right? Um, and that's what they were attempting to do. So I do wanna say that um, it's important that you encourage your reps and tell them, thank you. And I know that that sounds weird, but let me tell you, it wasn't an easy decision for every single rep that walked out. It was a very difficult decision for many, while others were like, yep, we're out. It wasn't that easy. And so I wanna encourage you to encourage those other reps so that they definitely are like, yes, because as far as I'm concerned, we shouldn't go back. We have the most restrictive voting laws in this country. So I don't know why we need to add to the restrictions. So personally, I don't wanna go back at all. I don't have to go back. And it's a lot more difficult to spread out through the entire state of Texas and find us if we're even in Texas, than if we come in and then we take a caravan out together, right? Like, it. so I, I don't see the point in coming back. Um, it will depend on what's on the call. 
if he's attempting to bring back anti-LGBTQ, um, terrible uh, bail legislation along with this voting legislation, there's nothing good there for us. So to me, I'd just rather not come back. But you know, there's a lot of different ways to attack this. I do know that our leadership is letting them know that there may be a chance of us walking out again because see, they didn't believe that before. This is only the fourth time it's ever happened in the history of Texas. And because we showed up on that day and it was like two hours until like <laughs> the deadline, they honestly did not, I don't think that they believed that we would actually accomplish it. So I applaud all of my colleagues because at the end of the day, it was a difficult decision. Um, everybody had a, a different analysis to make, but we got it done. And, and we truly saved democracy, at least for now, um, not just for Democrats, but for all Texans. Yeah, I, I completely agree with uh, Representative Crockett and Representative Zwiener. Um, Representative Zwiener mentioned you know, so much was added in the conference committee, which is kind of the last part of the legislative process. And so that the, the very end of the game, they were um, they were adding lots of new material, and they were also doing it in the in the middle of the night. Uh, and I don't know about y'all, but I was raised that if you have to do something in the middle of the night, you're probably up to no good. And and that's exactly what what uh, our Republican colleagues were doing at the very end of session, you know, debating this uh, when no one else was watching. Um, you know, on the on the quorum break, uh, and again, I, I know most of us probably know what that is, but you need 100 members uh, to conduct business uh, on the floor of the House. That's what quorum is. And so if 51 members leave and break quorum, then you can't do anything. You can't conduct business. And since we were at the deadline uh, to pass bills and the voter suppression bill was the last major bill uh, that needed to get passed, we broke quorum that evening before we could take a vote on it, which killed the bill. Um, and, and, and breaking quorum has only happened four times in Texas history. And it's not a decision that we made lightly. Um, our Democratic caucus um, really wrestled with this issue. But I think the consensus was we can debate issues on the floor of the House. And we do debate issues. And as Texas Democrats, we lose most of the time You know, on the heartbeat bill, on the permitless carry bill. Um, we, we voted, we fought, we debated, we tried to kill bills. And at the end of the day, if we're not successful, we take an up, up or down vote. And oftentimes the three of us and our Democratic colleagues lose that vote. But we, we, we get back to it next, on the next day, like big boys and girls, and, and we live to fight another day and we continue our work. We don't break quorum every time that we have a disagreement. We can debate issues, but we can't debate democracy itself. And, and I think that was the, the, the final consensus among our Democratic colleagues is that the Republicans were trying to rig the rules of the game. Um, I, you know, when I was growing up, my sister, my little sister loved to play Monopoly. And the reason she loved to play Monopoly is because she was really good at it. And like, she, you know, I would, I would end up playing with her for hours. I would always lose at Monopoly. She's an accountant, so she's much better at money than I am. But I never left the game. The only reason I would have left the game is that for some reason in the middle of our monopoly, if my sister had threatened to rig the rules and change the games of the rules uh, or change the rules of the game. And that's exactly what uh, our Republican colleagues were attempting to do. And, and that's why we had to take this extraordinary measure of, of breaking quorum and walking out. Uh, and I, I think it was the exact right decision. And I, I agree with Representative Crockett that that threat now hangs over the special session and hopefully can be used as leverage to negotiate a much less damaging version of, of SB7 uh, if it comes to that. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, this one goes back to Representative Crockett. So, um, you know, we with TYD, we know Representative Tallarico through uh, his couple of terms he's gotten under his belt as the youngest um, uh, member of the legislature, uh, as well as a uh, Woco Young Dems member. Uh, we know Representative Zwiener as a member of our Texas uh, College State, uh, Texas State College uh, Dems, and frankly, she's going to be modest about it, but I think her coupled with their activism are the only reason why we saw uh, multiple openings of new um, campus uh, voting locations uh, over the last few years. Um, so has always been a massive champion of, of our organization. Um, Representative Crockett, your election was a bit of a pivot uh, to more of a firebrand activist representation for your district and one that frankly, our members want to see a lot more of exactly what you're doing. Um, and so, you know, what kind of were some of your biggest learning curves from your first term? Maybe some 
um, conceptions you had about the legislature that were quickly turned on their head uh, it, when uh, you know it went to real time representation? Yes, thanks for the question. Um, so <laughs> there was so much that I didn't anticipate. Um, I will start off with, I think something that really struck all of us, which was just kind of how far right we went um, in speaking to older members and speaking even to like the Dean of the Democrats, um, Symphonia Thompson, you know, she's like, I've never seen a session like this. So that, that says a lot when she's been there for 48 years, right? So I, I think that it did throw everyone off. Um, I think that it probably threw me off more than most simply because I thought, man, this is our time, this is our chance because we saw a summer full of protest. So I thought, okay, finally. I mean, we saw not just a summer in Texas, but a summer in the world. We had longer protests than we'd had in modern day history um, when George Floyd was killed. And so I was like, oh, this is great. You know, we're, we're finally going to get somewhere in the legislature because they see that this is really a big thing. Um, and that didn't happen. We also saw that people were dying because we were dealing with this pandemic and Texas has led the country in uninsured for so long. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, finally, we'll take that good federal money and we will expand upon healthcare access in this state. And it didn't happen. We had El Paso happen. And so this is the first session since the El Paso shooting. And so I was like, surely we're gonna, you know, we're, we're gonna do some smart things on guns. And it didn't happen. In fact, we went the opposite way every chance we could. We, we did just the opposite of what we should have been doing. And so um, one of the things that I did decide I was going to do um, is number one, I was gonna have to continue organizing. So at some point in time, I kind of hit this point in the session and I said, no, I got to call the activists. I got to call the organizations. I've got to get them behind me. We've got to create our own media. We've got to do our own thing so that the people know that I'm fighting for these things and that we're starting to put external pressure, um, you know, on those that are in the house. And we even took up with unlikely allies, such as gun owners of America, um, when the time was right. You know, it's like, get whoever you can uh, to work with you. So I did not really anticipate that I was going to have to do as much organizing as I did. I am thankful for it. Um, in addition to that, I never, um, I've never really been the best at politics. So uh, when they decided that they were gonna kill my bills because it was all political and it was because I dared to get on the back mic um, and not just get on the back mic to antagonize someone, but to ask real questions. Because my thought was I've been sworn in and elected as a full member of this legislative body. When I was elected, my district didn't say, well, we know that we're only going to get partial representation because she's a freshman. They wanted me to fight and do what was necessary, uh, regardless of if I'm in my first session or my fifth session. And so, you know, for me, uh, the only thing that I know is that I probably will not continue to seek to play the offensive game because they tend to try to tie your hands when you are saying, oh, I need this bill passed. They tend to try to hold that over your head. And so um, I plan to spend the interim just studying. My only job right now is for, you know, everybody has a role to play. My role on this team at this point is going to be making sure that I can kill bills. I want them to be afraid every time I head to the back mic and wonder if I'm about to kill their bill because I tend to be a, a decent uh, litigator. So I truly feel like I can learn these rules and really start to make these arguments to take their bills down. And at some point in time, you know, like I said, our negotiations were continuing to fail and you know, we'll get back to the point that I'm able to play more of the offensive game because at some point in time, they'll decide, listen, I just don't, I just don't want that smoke that you bring in. So yes, we will deal with you, but I, I'm going to take kind of more of the bully approach because essentially that is what they've done to us. Um, they have bullied and bullied and bullied and I, I'm just not subscribing to it. So 
Uh, everyone has their own style. <laughs> um, as you can see, Rebs Wiener was on the back mic uh, calling points quite often, um, you know, and it, it's it's interesting when Rep Tallarico gets on the back mic uh, because he gets on there with precision and with a mission. And you should feel some kind of way if he goes to the back mic. He doesn't go every day, but when he goes, it's about to go down. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I want to send him much love for for at least killing the critical race theory bill now. The fact that the Senate decided that they were gonna raise the dead is a whole other issue, but he did his part on the House side. And once again, the Senate is the issue. So if I could encourage um, you guys to do anything, I mean, obviously we need to flip House seats for sure and really try to push to get that majority, but man, we need some help in the Senate because the Senate is just, I mean, they are on their, old, their whole other planet um, and so often they try to just ignore us, all 150 of us in the house. Yeah, I think uh, Steve Toth still checks under his bed every night for Representative Tallarico. So we all <laughs> we all appreciated uh, the the precise and uh, accurate uh, needling of that ridiculous bill. And and we'll we'll toss the next question over to um, both Rep Tallarico and Zwiener. We'll start with you, Representative Tallarico. So we know as young people, right, that it's a farce. This idea that like privilege is only home is the Republican Party, right? That there's no racism within the Democratic Party in our own house. Um, so we, as a generation, have decided, right, that uh, A, we know that privilege rob robs us of the fullness of our humanity, and it's our job as a generation to push the envelope on that issue. Um, and we've seen both of you do this in the house, but what are some ways that, you know, in a building that can be so hostile to marginalized communities, how do you ensure that you're supporting, uplifting, and centering the voices of your Black and Brown colleagues? Yeah, it's such a great question. And, you know, when you see the Republican caucus and the Democratic caucus uh, split into their two groups um, on the floor of the House to strategize, it's really a, a striking image because, you know, the Republican caucus is almost entirely old, white, Christian, straight, cis men from rural Texas. So they, they essentially look identical. It's a homogeneous group. Um, everybody who's not that is in the Democratic caucus, right? Uh, if you're a person of color, woman, LGBTQ+, plus, young, uh, non-Christian, or, or an atheist, you know, you are in the Democratic caucus, which in some ways makes it more difficult because if you're, if you're a homogeneous group, it's much easier to enforce loyalty, um, to, to enforce cohesion, to make decisions as, as one unit. Whereas the Democratic Party being more of a coalitional group, um, we have to, we have to navigate um, different identities, different lived experiences, different beliefs and perspectives, um, and so it's a it's a it's an entirely different job than what the Republicans have to do. The Republicans just have to stand up for older white guys in rural areas, and then we have to stand up for everybody else. And so, as a member of that caucus, I bring a a limited perspective given my limited life experience, and so I have to spend a lot of my time, especially as a white straight cisgender male to learn as much as I can from my colleagues and most importantly, from activists uh, and advocates. And, and so I try to, as much as I can, when I, when I um, and am about to fight on an issue that doesn't necessarily affect me directly uh, as an individual person, I try to fall back on the advocates and activists and community organizations that have been doing this work for years. So, you know, on the critical race theory bill, on the trans athletes bill, you know, both because of my position in the public education committee, because of my history as an educator, I was kind of tasked with helping to, to lead the fight on, um, but neither of those bills necessarily affects me directly. Um, and so I had to spend a lot of my time learning and listening, which is, you know, once you're elected to a position like that, your, your instinct is to, is to stop learning, right? You think like, well, I've been elected state rep or I've been elected county commissioner or school board member. And so I'm, I'm done evolving as a person or evolving in my learning. And that is by far the biggest mistake that you can make um, in any kind of leadership position, whether you're an elected official or the head of a business or the head of a, a community organization, you can never stop learning and growing, especially if you come from a place of, of privilege, which I have my entire life as a white boy growing up in Texas. And so it's a, it's a constant process. And oftentimes it's a, a painful process to learn 
about the ways in which I've been complicit in the oppression of, of marginalized people in the state. And, and that pain is necessary if we're gonna become more fully human. And, and that I think should be all of our goals, whether you're elected official or not. Rep. Wiener. Well, since Representative Tallarico offered such a good philosophical take, I'll talk about just a couple real specific moments. Um, you know, it's a joke that like some of the most useful commentary for women are, uh, this other woman said X, did you hear her? Or, oh yeah, she said that a minute ago. And just trying to remind people about the voices of marginalized folks. And I remember a very specific moment, you know, we had, um, Representative Mary Gonzalez, another young D, become the vice chair of appropriations this session. Um, Rep Gonzalez is Latina, she's LGBTQ, she's one of the youngest women ever elected to the Texas House, and she is absolutely fantastic and has, has earned her leadership roles by hard work and a lot of know-how. Um, and on budget night, there was a group of men, I won't say who any of them are, I'll be kind, but um, who were having an argument over a potential amendment on the budget. And Mary was trying to get a word in, Rep Gonzalez, I should say, was trying to get a word in. Um, and I just kind of sat there going, hey, I think Mary has an idea. Hey, I think Mary has an idea. Hey, I think Mary has an idea. Y'all, it took like a solid six or seven minutes of Mary trying to say something and these guys arguing and me trying to point out that she had something to say before they finally heard her and Mary opened her mouth fixed the entire problem and we all got to move on. Um, but I think we always need to be very aware of the situations we're in about whether or not um, we are the right person to be the face of an issue, whether or not we are taking up space that could be available to somebody else. Um, and if we are to, to make that space available. Now it is interesting because you know Representative Crockett mentioned that um, if you're the person up there killing bills, um, someone might come and kill your bills back, which is certainly something I experienced this session. So sometimes it's also the role of the ally to be the person up front, killing the bill, taking the heat so that somebody else doesn't have to take that. But either way, it's really on us to sit back, take stock. Um, and I'll also make a specific mention with the walkout. I had people ask me, you know, are you walking? And I said, if representatives Nicole Collier and Rafael Anchia go, I go, like I do whatever they do. And that's the chair of the Mexican American Legislative Caucus and the chair of the Texas Legislative Black Caucus. And so when we're looking at a piece of legislation whose most egregious harm is to people of color, it's people of color who should be making the decisions. Um, when it's an issue whose most egregious harm is to LGBTQ people, LGBTQ people should be making the call um, and, and down the line. Um, and I think that's something we as a caucus um, can always get better at, but I think we've done a decent job trying to center the folks most impacted um, in whatever the issue is. Thank you both so much. So I, I do have other questions available, but I wanna to pivot to, to folks that are here uh, in the general body today. Uh, if anyone has any questions for the representatives, go ahead and raise your hand. Awesome. Vice Chair, uh, President of the Texas College Democrats, JJ Martinez. You're muted, JJ. Yeah, there we go. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is JJ, and I'm the President of the Texas College Democrats. Representative Tulliker, it's good to see you again. Um, and I am curious, obviously, um, I'm a person of faith, consider myself a person of faith. Um, and really dislike, and I know Representative Tolerico, you feel the same way, really dislike the monopoly that Republicans in Texas especially have taken on faith and on communities of faith. And so my question really simply is, especially as we're heading into legislate or special sessions that are going to be weaponized very heavily against Democrats and against you know, people of color, how can we mobilize around people of faith, excuse me, uh, to help fight some of these bills like voter suppression, um, redistricting, and things like that? Yeah, it's a great question. It's great to see you too, JJ. And, and um, you know, I, I have to say there, there have been groups and people who have been doing this work a lot longer than I have. And I think about um, Texas Interfaith, I think about Austin Interfaith here in my community um, who bring together religious leaders from many different uh, faith traditions to advocate for human rights, for voting rights uh, in our state at the state capitol. 
Um, I was I uh, was baptized and and grew up at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church here in Austin. Uh, our pastor is Dr. Jim Rigby. He baptized me. He performed the marriage ceremony for my parents uh, when I was young. Uh, and you know he has continually been a prophetic voice in the best tradition of of uh, of our faith uh, in speaking out on on some of these causes. In fact, he was arrested outside of Greg Abbott's office over SB4, the Show Me Your Papers bill in 2017. Um, and so I, you know, I think we as progressives can learn a lot um, from our faith leaders about how to communicate about some of our values. Um, and this is something the right wing and the religious right in particular have done so well for, for the past four decades. Um, too often progressives and Democrats, we, sim we simply speak to people's material needs. And as we all know, human beings don't live on bread alone. And so although meeting people's material needs in terms of economic justice, uh, in terms of educational opportunity, you know, those things are really important. But people, as human beings, we naturally search for meaning and for purpose, uh, and we live out of our values and out of our principles. And, and in that way, faith traditions of all kinds speak to that real human need for meaning and for purpose. And until our political leaders, our political activists on the progressive side speak to that need and put our policy positions in a, in a larger framework of meaning, we're going to continue um, to lose elections. We're going to continue um, to lose out on voters who I think would be receptive uh, to our policy positions if they felt like it was being grounded in something more, something deeper, something more timeless um, than just a 12-point policy plan. And so I, I'm, you know, I'm so excited about some of the, the rising leaders on the Christian left. Um, I think of Raphael Warnock, uh, Reverend Raphael Warnock out of uh, Georgia, um, people like that who can, who can clearly ground their policy positions and their politics in a, in a faith tradition that, that is beyond time and space. And, and so I think uh, it's something we gotta do a lot uh, better job of um, as progressives and glad to see some people are leading the way on that across the country. I, I personally think that the biggest issue is that Republicans are just better at messaging in general than, than the Democrats are, right? Like they'll turn, you know, MAGA. It's a whole thing now, you know what I mean? Like, I just think that they're a lot better at messaging. Um, and sadly enough, I think, I know the Democrats are very cerebral. <laughs> <laughs> not so cerebral on the other side, right? I mean, let's think about it. As we're talking about this voting bill, where we're trying to change all the voting in Texas, they're like, we don't know how that got there. We don't know why that typo exists. And there were other typos, right? And so we tend to be very cerebral and we tend to focus on um, like our resumes and things like that. And I think Republicans really just keep it like, it, they literally live by kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Right. And so, you know, they've been able to say, well, they believe in abortions. So therefore, they're the Antichrist. Right. So, you know, I grew up, my dad is a, uh, is a preacher. Um, I grew up singing in the gospel choirs. Um, and honestly, even when it comes to Black folk, they don't even really question because so much of uh, who Black people are was really born out of the Black church. So it's not really like, as big a deal, but I do think that we are losing some of our um, Latino brothers and sisters uh, because Republicans are able to couch it. And so I think that instead of us just focusing on having the better candidates, because we see better candidates lose all the time, I can take you back to Hillary and Trump. I'm just saying, like we focus so much on actual credentials, actual qualifications, and we miss out on messaging completely. And I think if we don't start to really um, shift things around and, and start to say, well, you know, if we're going to talk about being Christian-like, let's talk about how we're, we are treating our homeless or our unhoused brothers and sisters. Are we looking out for them? Is that what Jesus would want us to do? If we're going to start talking about being pro-life, then can we talk about why we are not making sure that people have health care? You know, like, I think that it's about twisting, you know, because we know that honestly, we do the things that promote equity. That is more of a Christian principle, right? It's not just saying I'm a Christian, it's what I do. And focusing on the things that they do that are really unchristian-like, because they do a lot. 
that really is not very Christian like, um, especially when we start talking about poor people. So, um, you know, I think that it's about really having a, a strategy when it comes to messaging that's going to start to kind of flip things around. And, and I'll just mention very quickly that, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a person of faith, um, but I think someone who does a really good job speaking from that lens, well, two people I'll call out who they, I do think a really good job speaking are Representative Joe Moody. Um, his speeches against the permitless carry bill, both when we voted on the conference committee report and when we finally voted against it on the floor. Um, and also his speeches on the death penalty do a really good job incorporating his faith tradition and sharing how his policies grounded in it. Um, but the, the other person I really wanted to call out who had just a fantastic moment on the floor this session is Representative Jeannie Inahosa, who spoke against the heartbeat bill um, with her own personal story and talking about her faith tradition, her cultural tradition, how private it is, and how these conversations forced her to share these private stories, and then shared a very personal, intimate story. Um, and I, I would recommend just checking those out for examples of I think people doing a really strong job messaging from that space. Uh, I got, what are their names again? Representatives Gina Inahosa speaking on SB8 and Representative uh, Joe Moody speaking on, oh, I don't remember the number of the permitless carry bill. 1927. Thank you. There were, all the bad bills were in the 1920s. There was like 1920, 1925, 1927, anyway. That's when, that's when they're trying to bring us back to. Um, <laughs> uh, Josh, good to see you, friend. Uh, go ahead, last question from the audience. Hi, uh, thank you, Colby. Um, so first off, introduce myself. My name is Josh Tutt. I'm a candidate for Texas State Representative here in House District 13, uh, taking my spotlight where I can. Um, and I'm an independent member, uh, at large member, excuse me, of Texas Young Democrats. Uh, first, I want to thank all the representatives for being here. I think I can definitely speak for all of us and say that you've inspired all of us, definitely inspired me. Uh, and my question here is, what do you think that the impacts were on this session for rural Texans? There's a lot of us young folks out here. Um, and what is what does this session mean for us? Well, you're still screwed on health care. I, I mean, I kind of think that's one of the most dramatic impacts on rural Texas is that we really needed to take action uh, to keep our rural hospitals whole and to ensure that rural Texans have access to affordable health care. And we didn't. Um, and that it was in a situation where Congress dramatically sweetened the pot for us to expand Medicaid um, and cover another million and a half Texans. Um, it's also in a year where we lost our Medicaid waiver because of procedural issues and are now going to have to reapply to it. Um, and, and we didn't take material action there. Um, and I think that's really unfortunate. Um, there are a couple good things for rural Texas. HB5, the broadband bill, is a good piece of legislation. It'll be an even better piece of legislation if the federal government uh, funds an infrastructure package that funnels some dollars into it. Uh, but it's basically legislation to try and set up the planning framework to invest more um, resources in getting consistent access to broadband across the state of Texas. Um, and then we also did pass legislation to make it easier for folks to access virtual health care appointments um, and have those be compensated fairly. Um, that I think is a positive thing for rural Texas. But I think the main, the main show in town is that we, we did not expand health care access. Um, and that affects rural Texas more dramatically than anybody else. Uh, absolutely. Thank you for your question, Josh, and, and your answer, Representative Zwiener. Um, something that, you know, our Black Caucus Chair, uh, Stuart Williams, uh, constantly reminds us, and, and you, it, you might find it interesting that at the beginning of my term, we had a super majority of rural members on our executive committee, um, is that rural does not equal white. Um, and so if Stuart was here, he would remind us of that. Uh, so I had to throw that in there. Uh, just real quick, kind of like 60 second closing um, from our representatives. Uh, we'll start with Representative Crockett. Um, I just want to add to what you just said, though, really quickly. Uh, we may actually end up with another seat in East Texas that may actually be an African American seat. So um, look out for that. That's a possibility. We'll see what the numbers look like when we officially get the numbers, which would be really exciting. Um, but what I would say is that, you know, you guys are the heartbeat of the party, right? It's just kind of like we are the heartbeat of the house um, because, you know, after a while you've been in it so long, you get in a routine and so you stop growing. 
And so I would encourage you to stay so very involved, even when you feel as if your voice isn't being heard, just keep talking and just get louder. Because I do believe that young people is where we start to shift this party and get it back moving, right? There's a lot of people that are so energized by the fact that we walked out. And that's not just here in the state of Texas, that's throughout this entire country. I mean, there's a new energy and saying, you know what, we're gonna fight back. Right, because we've kind of gotten a little complacent. We've kind of just sat there a little bit, but like there's a new fight, there's a renewed fight and we need young fighters. And so I'm encouraged. I believe that all of you are a lot better than I ever was um, because I can't say that I was your age and I was this engaged or involved. And so there's no limit to what it is that you can do. There's no limit to what you will do. I know plenty of you volunteer on campaigns, continue to do that because that's how you learn. That's when you learn how to run your own campaign is because you've had that experience behind the scenes. You know what to expect. You make the connections. You understand what type of money is going to be, be required. You understand who will give you that money. Um, you start to understand how policy really is developed. And so I am so encouraged by you. I am always here for you. If there's anything that I can do myself or my team, Carol is on here somewhere, hopefully, and hopefully he will drop all of my contact information. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Representative Sweener. Yeah, I, I want to sort of echo what Representative Crockett said, which is get involved in some way or another. There is momentum right now. We have this huge opportunity, and I know we say that every cycle, but it's because we have huge opportunities every cycle. Um, so much of what we saw this session was Republican hubris. They went, ah, oh, Democrats spent a bunch of money against us and they didn't manage to change the makeup of the house. Well, they're ignoring a few things. One is we flipped a state board of education seat, Rebecca Belmetro from right here in house district 45. We flipped a state Senate seat and we had the closest presidential margin in my lifetime, in a gen whole generation. Um, and that's, those are amazing things that mean that the demographic shifts that we've been talking about in Texas are still happening. And it means we need to keep doing the work. Um, and because Republicans operated out of this hubris, they pursued a far right agenda supported by a minority of Texans, some, some pieces supported by a minority of members in their own party. Only 19% of Texans think permitless carry is a good idea, y'all. Um, completely banning abortion with no exceptions for rape or incest or a non-viable fetus is just cruel and so far outside the mainstream political opinion. And this is after an election cycle where those who were in vulnerable seats who survived, survived by campaigning to the middle and talking about how they were gonna expand healthcare access and protect public education. And instead faced with twin crises of the pandemic and the blackout, all they did is pursue culture war fights. Um, and so we need to organize, we need to talk to folks, we need to tell them that the folks who are out there fighting for them, fighting for everyday Texans to have enough food on the table, to have access to health care, um, and to have everyone's rights protected are Democrats. Um, and so I want to encourage everyone to get involved, work for a candidate you are passionate about. If that candidate's yourself, awesome. If it's not you, awesome. If it's a local candidate, great. If it's a gubernatorial candidate, great. Just get out there and do the work because us campaigning at every single level, um, including in so-called impossible districts, which my district theoretically was in 2018, um, make a difference and they boost turnout and they get folks to the polls. And the only way we are going to flip Texas is by fighting in every corner of Texas. So wherever you live, whatever level of government you're passionate about, be out there, get engaged, be helping us register people to vote right now and get them to the polls next November. Your representative representative Tallarico, take us home yeah you know i just i feel like this has been a difficult uh, year for all of us uh, who are on the front lines of the progressive movement in the state that we all love so much and the 2020 election this legislative session have have really been hard on the heart um and the goal of of bullies is to is to fill us all with so much despair so much um, frustration, so much anger that we end up losing hope. You know, that's, that's, the, that's been the playbook of bullies throughout history. Um, and, and so it's on all of us, it's especially on our youngest activists uh, to not lose that hope uh, that this, this fight is much longer um, than any of our individual fights, um, that we are uh, perhaps not gonna see 
uh, justice in our lifetimes, but we are all living our own lives as, as gifts to the future. Um, you know, my pastor when I was growing up always said that um, hope is believing that your sunset is somebody else's dawn. And, and that's exactly where I feel like we're at in our movement here in Texas. Um, we, JJ's question earlier about, um, about faith, you know, I think this is a reason that political activism um, needs to be grounded in something deeper. And Representative Crockett is exactly right. There is no better case of that than the Black liberation movement in this country. And, you know, the Civil Rights Movement and Dr. King were, was an explicitly spiritual religious movement. Um, it was beyond politics. It was bigger than electoral success. Uh, and that's exactly the kind of um, rootedness that I think all of us need in this struggle here in Texas, because it's only going to get um, more difficult um, and, and it's going to get harder uh, over the next year and in the 2022 uh, midterms. Um, there's, a great, um, there's a great book by Dr. King called Where Do We Go From Here, which I would encourage all of you to read, especially this year, um, this summer. Um, and he talks about progress not being a straight line. Um, and he talks about, he uses the analogy of, of going up a mountain and trying to reach a city at the top of the mountain. And he says, sometimes you go and you find yourself on the dark side of that mountain where you can't see the city on the top. You feel like you're going backwards, but you're actually moving forward and you're eventually gonna see the city and it's gonna be a lot closer. And that's, that's the kind of hope, kind of stubborn hope that I think all of us in Texas need at this particular moment in our state's history, because we are, we are moving somewhere. And you look at Georgia and you look at Arizona, you look at Virginia, and, and we are only a few years behind them. Um, but the, the, last, um, the last few chapters of this story are gonna be the most difficult. And so I hope we can all take an opportunity this summer before the special session start to recharge, to reflect, and to ground ourselves in something deeper, uh, because that's the only way we'll sustain this mass movement of ours. Thank you so much to each of you. Um, we are so honored to have your support. And the ferocity of spirit that each of you display in fighting for us in the halls of power does not go unnoticed. So it has been an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for being available to our membership and never hesitate to let us know how we can support you. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.